remain standing for a moment. Let's pray together. Lord, Grace Bible Church has sung your praises because you are worthy. You're worthy of all worship. And we have worshiped you in communion as we've remembered the, the shed blood of your son. We've remembered his resurrection and we have proclaimed it and we continue to proclaim it until the day that you return. We've sung, Lord, about the mystery of your grace, the mystery that it would even come to sinners such as us. And Lord, this is, the, this is certainly the, the cry of our heart this morning. Every true child, every true son or daughter that you have here in this congregation, we join together and sing that heartily, acknowledging that there's, there's no explanation for why your grace would come to us. It simply is told to us from your word that it came to us out of an overflow of your, of your character. You're a gracious God by nature, and so for that reason we praise you, even knowing that there's, there's nothing in us that could have directed your attention to even bestow grace or mercy on us in the first place. And so even as we sing about the mystery of your grace, we, we acknowledge how appropriate that all worship go exclusively to you. And Lord, we've also worshipped you this morning during the equipping hour as, as Omri reminded us how clear your word is. And, and Lord, there's, there would be no reason for what we're about to do. This this gathering together to open up a book written over the uh, last 4,000 years would be absurd if you did not give us clear revelation. And we do this every week. We do this Lord's Day after Lord's Day. We open up your word. We direct our attention to it because you are the God who speaks. You're not just a God who exists. You're a God who speaks. And your speech is as clear as your own thinking. And so, Lord, give us your mind this morning. Let us peer into your heart, into your mind, so that we would learn and so that we would be changed. Give us grace as we hear from you. Thank you, Lord, that we do not hear from a man this morning, but we hear from you. And so give us humility appropriate for such, a, for such an endeavor. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, yeah, go ahead and take a seat. I'm going to ask you to grab your Bible and open up to the book of Mark. Book of Mark, chapter 2. Plan to look at the last narrative in Mark, chapter 2 this morning. This is a profound story. It's it's one I've been looking forward to, and then it got here this week, and I was beginning to regret. It's a story that is so deep and so profound. Even as we heard in Equipping Hour just this morning, God's Word has all clarity, and whenever we lack clarity, it's a, it's a subjective lack of clarity. And, and I was uh, counting down the days this week, looking at this text, and uh, so encouraged, though, by the increasing clarity I got from God's Word. And as we, as we look at this um, story, I want to just begin, I just want to introduce the topic or the thrust of this story, the theme of this story, the punch of what Jesus is doing in this story, even by going back, if, if you will, joining me and going back to some of the thoughts that I had as I was first saved. I was saved at the age of 18. I had grown up in the church, and I remember really reading my Bible for the first time with the eyes of faith, and I was just overcome with this compulsion that what I was reading in Scripture had to get out. In my naivety and in my own ignorance, um, I was discovering things in God's Word that I had never heard talked about in the church. And I began to wonder, why, why have we not talked about these things? There's so much glory here. There's so much greatness here. And so reading through the Bible for the first time with the eyes of faith, I began to wonder, have I discovered something that no one else on the planet knows? 
There's too much glory here. There's too much goodness here. How, surely nobody knows about this, or we'd be all talking about it, because this is bottomless, what I'm seeing in the Scripture, about a God that I had just become acquainted with very recently in a saving way. At that point, in my own conversion, I really thought what the church needed most was a recovery of God's voice in the church. And that's what I devoted my life to from that year onward. And this story really strikes a chord with me. This story strikes a chord with me because in this story, there's a showdown between Jesus and the Pharisees. It's the story of a Sabbath walk through the grain fields. And it affords us a case study in what happens when religion becomes contaminated with and when it degenerates into mere human religion or merely man-made religion. This is what happens when people have God's word and then they assume that possession of God's word is nine-tenths of the law. And they stop acting on it and they stop interpreting it correctly. These Pharisees in this story, they have the truth, they have the scriptures, but they are rejecting the truth incarnate, Jesus Christ himself. This is the way it always goes, doesn't it? Every time the human worshiper begins with divine revelation and the human worshiper starts to insert his own interpretation and how that religion and how that worship ought to go, what it ought to look like and how we carry it out, it always uh, contaminates it. And you're, you're left with not just a minimal version of religion as we've talked about in previous stories in Mark chapter 2, it actually destroys divine worship. The resulting religion is just kind of this man-made religious monstrosity. It becomes more than a perversion of the original. It actually takes over and turns the object of worship from God to man, and it harms every worshiper in that religion, and it harms everyone who's a neighbor to somebody worshiping in that religion. Let's just grab a few examples. Interestingly, in Judaism... Judaism obviously starts with a word from God. God speaks to his chosen nation. And the Jewish people is the only people group on the face of the planet with a promise of salvation. And God gives them his word. He gives them his revelation. And what happens over the years of teaching that scripture to those people you fast forward several centuries to the intertestamental period, and you have, in synagogue worship, you have rabbis who become recognized teachers. And the way that it goes with the oral tradition versus what's written in Scripture is, the oral tradition is passed down from teacher to teacher to teacher, going all the way back to Sinai. And at Sinai, obviously, we know that God gave Moses the written revelation of the Torah, but... What about the personal conversations that would have happened between God and the Aaronic priesthood? And that's where it introduces a a new line of thought, a new interpretive authority, and those conversations that happened that weren't recorded in the Scripture, they were passed down from rabbi to rabbi to rabbi. And so several centuries later, that becomes uh, the, the, the primary thinking of interpretation is you need to know those private conversations, the oral tradition, if you're going to make any sense of the Scripture. We're the only ones who know it, so we'll tell you what it means. You just do that for a few centuries? Christ himself shows up on earth to fulfill the very scriptures that you are reading, and he's not recognized. Because man-made religion has so overcome the meaning of the scriptures that the real meaning can't even be seen anymore. Here's another example. Roman Catholicism basically does the same, has the same argument, but instead of going back to Sinai through Levitical lineage to the rabbis, it goes back to Jesus with the apostles through a, a so-called papal succession. And so going back to the fact that we all have the written scriptures, what not everybody else has is access to those private conversations, the ones that weren't written down between Jesus and his apostles. And so that, those private conversations, they're passed down orally, and that, that becomes why there, there's, a, there's a meaning here about what the scriptures, what religion ought to be. We're, we'll tell you what it looks like because we have access to that. 
And now it's happening all over again in Protestantism. In Protestantism, it, it's really becoming written revelation plus the interpretive authority of whatever church, the Protestant community, favorite theologian, confession, creed, or denominal, denominational articulation that really becomes a key for how we read the scriptures. In all three of those examples, the common denominator is that they all start with the written revelation of God, and they all contaminate the meaning. In this story, we see that happen between the Pharisees and Jesus walking with his disciples. I titled this, Human Religion Indicts Divine Truth. And indicts is in quotes because it doesn't actually indict it. It attempts to. It tries to. Human religion will pervert the original to the point that it will actually try to indict the truth. It will become inconsistent with itself. It will actually turn right around and contradict the scriptures. And in this case, it turns right around and rejects truth himself, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's interesting Every single time man-made religion creeps into some, something that started with divine revelation, it always diminishes the glory of God. It dishonors God in some profound way, and it also harms mankind. In other words, here's a simple way to think about it. No one knows how to glorify God better than God does. So we start changing his message, we start changing his revelation, his glory only goes one direction, down. He nailed it. He revealed himself with perfect glory in his scriptures. It's unimprovable. And so we start changing it, oh, sorry, just went down. No one knows what's better for man than God. So we start tampering with God's word, man suffers. It's to our harm, it's to our detriment. What was originally brilliantly and blazingly for the glory of God in the scripture dishonors God. And what was for the ultimate benefit and spiritual blessing of man becomes a harm to man's own existence. And that's the way it always goes with human religion. And so what we need to do this morning is we're going to dive into this story very quickly. We've got to make some progress because there's some interesting historical background. In fact, as I'm about to read the story, you might think that, interpret, that introduction that you just gave us, John, is the wrong introduction for this text. And uh, the reason why I believe it's the right introduction is because the issue itself in this story is Sabbath tradition. But the principle is something that applies directly to all of us. And that is when man-made religion, human religion, starts to indict the scripture, it starts to indict divine truth, and we pervert it. And so again, as we read this story, you'll notice very quickly that the issue is the Sabbath. What does it mean to honor the Sabbath? There's two conflicting opinions, and you see one on the side of the Pharisees, you see another on the side of Jesus and his disciples and the Old Testament. However, I don't imagine that... Um, your particular struggle this morning is that you have uh, you know, 24 chapters uh, of written in your post personal devotions about how to, how to honor the Sabbath, and uh, you just created a way to honor the Sabbath. I don't imagine that's your struggle this morning, but we all struggle with the temptation to want to make Christianity into something that it's not. We would all fall prey to that if we are not careful to watch our hearts. And this is a story that reveals how the Pharisees contradicted the scriptures to arrive at the conclusions they came to. And let's read the story together from verse 23 to verse 28. And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and he and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest 
and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him. Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In verse 23 and 24, we realize that the issue here is Sabbath tradition. Uh, The story just assumes that you would be familiar with some Sabbath law and Sabbath tradition. In this particular story, Jesus doesn't initiate anything. It just describes them walking, and they're walking along uh, on this journey. And it's also interesting that, um, um, that there are very strict traditions about how far you could walk on the Sabbath. Um, now, if they're walking through grain fields, I, I believe the limit is 2,000 feet. Um, and so if they're walking through grain fields, they probably violated that. But if they had to violate that, so did the Pharisees. So that wouldn't, you know, became really kind of an obsolete confrontation. But here they are walking through the grain fields. The real problem then is the fact that they are picking heads of grain. Okay, and so now you have this, 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 this uh, depiction of them grabbing the wheat, and, um, and it, w- it wouldn't really work with corn, you know, because you have to grab an ear, but, you know, any, any, any type of uh, grain like a wheat that would have a chaff, you could just rub it to get, rub the head together, get the chaff off, you'd have the, the pure grain, you could chew that up. Not particularly tasty, but if you chew it long enough, it kind of becomes gummy and you can swallow it. And so, hey, it's maybe a little snack. I mean, they're, they're, they're famished. They're, they're following Jesus. They're talking. They're having this conversation. And you say, well, big deal. So they're eating some wheat as they're walking along. In fact, this is actually a typical function in, of the day. Deuteronomy 23, 25 says, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. And the picture here is a description of what's appropriate. Uh, when, when farmers in Israel would, would glean their, their harvest, they would leave a row out on the edge of the field that would be for the widow, the orphan, and the alien. And that was a way to provide for those who did not have uh, land or who were actually native Israelites who actually had land, but they had no husband or dad to farm the land. And so it became a way to provide for those who were destitute. And so what would happen is as you were walking along, there would be this like kind of leftover section that would provide for those who who, uh, couldn't provide for themselves. And it was a means of grace and mercy for for the nation. The problem would be is if you went in there with a sickle, in modern day vernacular, it would be like driving over to your your, your neighbor's field and with a combine and just, you know, taking his wheat. I mean, that would be, that's called theft. Uh, But to get some wheat for eating is not a problem. That's actually part of how you would harvest. That's part of how they would um, uh, cut down their grain. Now, here's where the problem comes. Exodus 34, 21, of course, just simply says, you shall work six days, but on the seventh day you shall rest. Even during plowing time and harvest, you shall rest. So they would stop work, and you shouldn't even plow, you shouldn't harvest, so you shouldn't be out there with a sickle doing labor on the Sabbath. Well, that doesn't seem too bad. Well, here's how the Jews interpreted that. In the Mishnah, which again records the oral tradition that would have been alive and active during Jesus' day, when this story took place, this would have been the kind of conversation that was taking place among the rabbis. In um, Shabbat chapter 7, verse 2, it says, The generative categories of acts of labor prohibited on the Sabbath are 40 less one. And this verse goes on to give a list of 39 things, activities, you cannot do on the Sabbath without desecrating it. Number one, he who sows. Two, plows. Three, reaps. Four, binds sheaves. Five, threshes. Six, winnows. And then it starts finishing up going through crops, and then it moves on to baking and uh, various um, agricultural functions and even sowing functions and how, you know, killing animals and, and cleaning animals. and all. It just goes through about 39 particular actions prohibited on the Sabbath. So number two is plows. Number three is reaps. And they look at this action of Jesus with his disciples. And his disciples are doing this, doing that, making a snack out of this wheat, and they are now guilty of violating the Sabbath, as interpreted by the Pharisees. 
Mind you, they're not breaking out a sickle. They're not driving over their neighbor's grain with a combine. <laughs> they are not stealing, and they are not just making profit. For who cares about the Sabbath? They are just simply eating a meal, eating a snack. Verse 24, the Pharisees are saying, look, look, what? <laughs> what's going on right here? Why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, when the Pharisees say they're doing what's not lawful, they're, they're, they're actually saying they're doing what is prohibited by our interpretation of Shabbat law. They are not saying what's in, in, uh, prohibited by the Old Testament. They're saying what's prohibited by our interpretation of the Old Testament. And so now they're just flat out confronting him. So that's the issue. The issue is this is really a showdown between what Jesus and his disciples are practicing versus how the Pharisees have handled the Old Testament scriptures and how they've given it meaning that it never actually originally had. So here comes the real indictment. The real indictment doesn't come from the Pharisees' attempt to indict Jesus. The real indictment is, of course, on the Pharisees. And that's actually so true. This is always true. Listen, uh, listen, if you're a believer, if you're not a believer, if you quarrel with Scripture, you always lose. If you try to indict Scripture, you are always indicted. Uh, C.S. Lewis said it well. <laughs> Every attempt to throw mud comes right back and lands in your face. It is impossible to make mud stick when it comes to truth. Here's the real indictment, and it starts in verses 25 and 26. We see that Scripture actually defines true worship. Scripture actually defines true worship. Verse 25 starts out with that very familiar phrase that Jesus was so fond to use, have you never read? Such a great argument. I mean, they're sitting there and they're indicting him, and Jesus' response is, have you never read? I mean, I, I don't think it's just like dripping, dripping with such cynicism, like, you know, are, are you such idiots? But you can't help but point out that he's just said, he's assuming, look, the story that I'm about to rem remind you of is in the scriptures, and it's so clear that the only conclusion that you could logically come to hearing what you're saying is that you've actually never read that story, which is a profound statement about the power and the clarity of scripture. I mean, if you're going to say that, the only conclusion I come to is you just never read the Bible. And so he says, have you never read what David did when he was in need and his companions became hungry? How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for anyone to eat except the priests, and he also gave it to those who were with him. Now, this is an interesting discussion, and in, in verse, 25, first, verse 25 and 26 are going to require um, a, a little bit of um, uh, background here. We're going to have to slow down here for a second because there's, there's several things that are, are challenging. First of all, when we read verse 25 and verse 26, it becomes really important to, to examine when Jesus says that David did what is not lawful, is he saying that David disobeyed God or is he saying that David's actions are also indicted by pharisaical interpretation? It's an interesting, we got we to be clear about that, because that would go two different ways. <laughs> As if Jesus were saying, look, David broke the law, and we all should, which is not what he's saying. When he says that David did what is not lawful, he's actually saying that David's own exonerated actions in the Old Testament are indicted by your practice of religion. He's helping the Pharisees to realize that their man-made religion is at odds with Christ, it's at, at odds with King David, and it's at odds with the Old Testament. And this is profound. There's one other really, really challenging issue here, and that comes in verse 26, and it's when Jesus says how David entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest. And, and that becomes, if you, read, if you read the commentaries, that's always going to, uh, almost always, going to have a, a massive discussion. Because if you're familiar with this story about David eating the, the bread that's the bread of the presence, which we're, we're going to look at in just a second, if you're familiar with that story, you might remember that 
Abiathar is not the priest. The priest is Ahimelech. And so, at first glance, and and honestly, the majority of commentators just don't know what to do with this. They're just like, oh, Jesus says it's Abiathar, but it's Ahimelech. I, I don't know. And usually, like the two common answers to like, why did he say um, Abiathar instead of Ahimelech? The two common answers are just simply, well, there seems to be some confusion in the Old Testament. Who was the dad and the son? Because if you compare kings with chronicles, there's an Abiathar. Uh, there's a, um, an Abiathar who gives birth, gives birth to uh, an Ahimelech, and then there's an Ahimelech who's the father of an Abiathar. So it sounds like a grandfather, son, grandson kind of dynamic, and so it's just confusing. And so you know, and they kind of just say, yeah, it's just it's kind of confused. Well, that's not really a help. Even if there is a grandson, son, grandson type of scheme where there's an Abiathar grandfather with an Ahimelech son with an Abiathar grandson, that's of no help to us because Jesus clearly says Abiathar. It's funny when I read the commentaries, uh, you know, it's almost like they just imagine, well, Jesus is just kind of being generic. And, and the second common answer is that's just, he's just kind of being, he's not being as precise and so it's just Abiathar. It's just in the time of Abiathar because he was next. So kind of generally, excuse me, generally it's in the time of Abiathar. Just generally, not precisely, just generally. And, and again, I'm sitting there thinking like, okay, d- can Jesus sometimes be less than precise? Well, sure. Sometimes he might not quote the Old Testament and, and cite the book. He might just say, uh, the Old Testament. He might just say Torah. He might say the law and the prophets. He, may, he might be less gen- more general or less general. But the question is, he's not being general. He's being specific. And I don't believe Jesus made a mistake. Is that so profound? It's almost like if you start assuming with the scriptures that God knows how to communicate and Jesus knows how to communicate and he knows why he's doing what he's doing, it leads to really, really helpful results. And so I gave up on all those explanations, and I started looking, before, I, before we comment on this and fall prey to Jesus' indictment, have you never read? It's amazing how clear this story really becomes when you take the time to read. Let's go back to 1 Samuel chapter 21. 1 Samuel chapter 21. We've got to figure out what's going on here. And having been alerted to the fact that Jesus mentions Abiathar by name, even though it's his dad who's functioning as the priest, we are already alerted that there's more than meets the eye. We're already alerted that we need to pay attention to this story to figure out what Jesus is doing with this rebuke. 1 Samuel chapter 21, let's start in verse 1. David came to Nob, that's a town uh, about a mile north of Jerusalem, uh, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech is now the father of Abiathar, who Jesus refers to. So this is the father of Abiathar, mentioned in Mark chapter 2. Ahimelech is the priest here, and Ahimelech came trembling to meet David and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? And, um, and since we're diving into a story that you, you're maybe not familiar with the context here, it's not that he was alone. He obviously has companions with him. He has this ragtag group of guys who are hanging out with him. It's, they, are, they are fleeing from um, Absalom. I'm sorry, they're fleeing from Saul. And uh, so here, he's not totally by himself. The issue is, you're the anointed son of Jesse. Samuel anointed you, and here you are without your security detail. Like, what in the world's going on? And so Himelech is concerned. And Himelech is loyal to David. He's loyal to the seed promise, to the redemptive purposes of God. And he's trying to figure out why in the world did David show up at my door with just this ragtag group of guys. You got, no, you got no security with you. What's going on? David said to him, like the priest, the king has commissioned me with a matter and has said to me, let no one know anything about the matter on which I am sending you and with which I have commissioned you, and I have directed the young men to a certain place. Now, therefore, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest answered David and said, there is no ordinary bread on hand, but there is consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, Surely women have been kept from us as previously when I set out, and the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was an ordinary journey. How much more than today will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him consecrated bread. For there was no bread 
There, but the bread of the presence, which was removed from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place when it was taken away. And that verse is really important. We're going to come back to that in a second. Now, one of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before the Lord, and his name was Doug the Edomite, the chief of Saul's shepherds. David said to Ahimelech, Now is there not a spear or a sword on hand? For I brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's matter was urgent. Then the priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you would take it for yourself, take it, for there is no other except it here. And David said, There is none like it. Give it to me. Now, at this point in the story, we're going to skip, we'll, we'll skip the last half of verse 21. We'll, we'll look at, uh, quickly at what happens in verse 22 in a moment. But there's a lot happening here that I want to make sure that we can appreciate uh, from a historical perspective. Um, first of all, what's going on here with this bread of the presence? It's called the bread of the presence, and it's bread that's baked every week. It's changed out every Sabbath. Every Sabbath, new bread is baked and put, replacing the bread from the previous week. And so you can read about that in Leviticus 25, and I'm sorry, Leviticus 24, verses 5 through 9 describe how this happens on the Sabbath every week. And so this is actually the day that they changed out the, the showbread with hot bread. So this is happening on the Sabbath, according to connecting verse 6 with Leviticus 24. Now, I want you to look at verse, uh, Leviticus 24 for a second because there's a statement in here about the, the, w- the purpose of this bread when it's removed, where, where it goes and, and the purpose, who it's for, really. Leviticus 24, verses 5 through 9, describes um, how you need to bake the bread. Um, and, and, and interestingly, the, the, uh, the, the weight of this stuff, two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake, as I was reading this week, I discovered that that's basically like a three-pound loaf. So these are pretty sizable loaves of bread. And uh, that's, that's, that'll, 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 that'll feed some folks, uh, 12 loaves of that size. You shall set them in two rows, six to a row, uh, on, on the pure gold table before the Lord. So this goes in the presence of the Lord. That's where the, that's where the bread would remain, is in the presence of the Lord. And, and at the time, you know, obviously this is before the temple was built. And so the tabernacle is in Nob, and this is where the Ark of the Covenant, this is where the tabernacle is is dwelling. And so this is what's happening in in Nob around the uh, elements of of worship from the tabernacle. Skip down to verse 8. Every Sabbath day he shall set it in order before the Lord continually. It's an everlasting covenant for the sons of Israel. It shall be for Aaron and his sons, and they shall eat it in a holy place. For it is most holy to him from the Lord's offerings by fire his portion forever. So every Sabbath, these bread, the bread would be replaced with hot loaves, and that was the right of the priest to eat. That's part of their, uh, how they made their living. It was even uh, you know, from tithes and from all the other sacrifices that uh, basically footed the bill to support a Levitical system. That was part of just the national taxes in the nation of Israel. But this was also part of it. And those who were serving would eat that bread. And so now when you skip over to 1 Samuel... Go back to 1 Samuel 21. The priest tells David, who is the king of Israel, who is anointed already by Samuel, and he's hungry, he's perishing, he's in need, as Jesus is highlighting. The point is, he's in need. And the priest says to David, there's no ordinary bread, but just consecrated bread. If only the young men have kept themselves from women. Now, that's important. Why is that so important? That becomes the stipulation that Ahimelech puts on uh, the men before he gives them something so sacred as consecrated bread. I mean, if it was just, hey, I got some left over in my lunch pail, he would have just given it to him. He, this is consecrated bread. This is a totally different issue. This is not an issue where he has the freedom to just be generous. So why does he say that? Well, this, this whole prescription goes all the way back to Exodus 19, and I, I warned you, we're going to have to do a little bit of historical background, so let's just keep moving here. Got one more, one more little line of thought to trace out, and then we're going to start making some, better, some progress. Go to Exodus 19. You remember Exodus 19? This is the beginning of the, the, the giving of the law on Sinai, and um, 
In Exodus 19, verses 4 through 6, you really have kind of the prologue to the entire Mosaic Covenant. Um, in verse 4, Moses, uh, God tells the people through Moses, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. And so the point here is, is that God wants to make Israel a nation of, a holy nation and a kingdom of priests. Skip to verse um, 12, Exodus 19, verse 12. You shall set bounds for the people all around. He's talking about all the way around Mount Sinai. Beware that you don't go up on the mountain or touch the border of it. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely be put to death. No hand shall touch him, but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether man or beast. He shall not live. When the ram's horn sounds a long blast, they shall come up on the mountain. So Moses went down from the mountain to the people and consecrated the people, and they washed their garments. And he said to the people, be ready for the third day. Do not go near a woman. And that's not some sort of gender slam. That's a statement just about the nature of how holy God is. And as he reveals later in the Torah, even, even uh, duly constituted intimacy in the bounds of marriage would make you ceremonially unclean to officiate in the presence of God in the temple. Same is true right here. As the nation is about to receive revelation, if somebody were ceremonially unclean and then went up on the mountain where God's coming down to dwell to start giving divine revelation to his people, bad things are going to happen. Now we're almost, we've almost connected these dots. Let me show you another text that connects the importance of ceremonial cleanliness to the military of Israel. I probably never imagined we'd be looking at a text like this to understand Mark, but this is actually extremely helpful. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 9 to 14. Deuteronomy 23, verses 9 to 14. You're going to hear language about God dwelling in the midst of the military encampment it sounds very much like Exodus 19. It sounds very much like God dwelling amid, amidst the people in the tabernacle and then in future generations in the temple. Uh, the, the same element of holiness was critical for the military if God's going to dwell with their military and give them success in a military fashion. So look at verse 9 through 14. When you go out as an army against your enemies, you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. If there is um, any, uh, I'm sorry, if there is among you any man who is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he must go outside the camp. He may not re-enter the camp. But it shall be when evening approaches, he shall bathe himself with water, and at sundown he may re-enter the camp. You shall also have a place outside the camp and go out there, and you shall have a spade among your tools, and it shall be when you sit down outside. You shall dig with it and shall turn to cover up your excrement. Look at verse 14. Since the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp to deliver you and to defeat your enemies before you, therefore your camp must be holy and he must not see anything indecent among you or he will turn away from you. This is a standard and this is a mandate for the military of Israel. When you go back and read, and we go forward from where we're at in Deuteronomy, you go forward now and read 1 Samuel chapter 21, you realize this is King David in, in a fight. He's in a fight running from his life from King Saul. And so here he is, and he is, this is a holy encampment. And Ahimelech says, look, I don't have any way to feed you except the consecrated bread that we just replaced with hot bread, and um, I can gladly give it to you if you meet the criteria of the priesthood type of nation criteria of Exodus 19, of the priestly type criteria of Leviticus 24, of the military criteria of cleanliness of Deuteronomy 23. And so that's what he says. Have you kept yourselves from women? He says, we have. And he gives them the consecrated bread. I mean, this is an absolute violation 
a pharisaical interpretation of what's allowed on the Sabbath. In fact, in the parallel in, in Matthew, Matthew 12, Jesus also says, haven't you read in the Torah and haven't you seen how the priests break the Sabbath and are innocent? When Jesus uses this phrase, doing what is lawful, he's not saying they are violating God's word. He's saying they're violating Pharisaical interpretation. David violated uh, Pharisaical interpretation. The priests, in order to obey the scriptures, violate Pharisaical interpretation. He's pointing out that the Pharisees have a man-made religion that actually indicts the scriptures. Haven't you read? And by the way, if you're, if you're tracking me, with me on this and how we're applying this to our own lives, I, I trust that every, every child of God in here has an appropriate fear and appropriate concern of how we can mishandle the scriptures. And you might be wondering, man, I don't want to do that. I desperately don't want to do that. Well, here's one of your first helps. Is that, that's not going to happen when you're humbly reading the scriptures. When you're humbly submitting to the scriptures. They're mishandling the scriptures, and you can't mishandle the scriptures without being indicted somewhere else. So in their attempts to indict the truth, they get indicted somewhere else. And this is just one of those examples. And that's always the way it goes. Okay, we are close to answering the question, why does Jesus say Abiathar? <laughs> we still haven't answered that question. Why does, why does Jesus say Abiathar? I mean, it's Ahimelech. Why didn't he just say Ahimelech? He's not being specific. Well, he is being specific. He's being specifically wrong if that's the issue. Two things are important. First of all, he doesn't use the typical preposition for in the time of Abiathar. Now, there's a typical preposition, and he doesn't use that one. He uses one that's a, that is a little bit more vague, and it would be translated around the time of Abiathar. But still, that doesn't answer the question of why does he mention Abiathar by name? That's what we've got to get to. 1 Samuel chapter 22. We've got to finish the story. 1 Samuel 22, verse, verse 1. David departed from there, and he escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and his father's household heard of it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, everyone who was discontented gathered to him. Wow, that's, that's the makings of a really profound band of protection. All the debtors, distressed and discontent folk become his 400 men. The Hebrew literally says riffraff. I'm just kidding, it doesn't say that, but that's the description there. <laughs> Verse 3, David went from there to Mitzpah of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, uh, let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what God will do for me. So he leaves them with the king of, uh, king of Moab. Uh, the prophet tells David, don't stay here in verse 6, so he departs. Verse 6, now Saul hears that um, David and, and all of his men are, um, uh, they, they've been discovered, they find their location, and so uh, in verse 7, Saul says to his servants who stood around him, Hear now, O Benjamites, will the son of Jesse also give to all of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? For all of you have conspired against me, so that there is no one who discloses to me when my son makes a covenant with the son of Jesse, and there is none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in ambush as it is this day. He realizes that the, the location of David just became known, and he's thinking, like, wh 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 why do I have you for my military intelligence? Nobody's, are you guys siding with my enemy now? Sometimes, listen, here's an opportune time for Doug the Edomite, verse 9. Then Doug the Edomite, who was standing by the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to, to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. He inquired of the Lord for him, gave him provisions, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent someone to summon Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's ha uh, household, the priests who were in Nob, and all of them came to the king. Saul said, listen now, son of Ahitub. And he answered, here I am, my Lord. Saul then said to him, why have you and the son of Jesse conspired against me in that you have given him bread and a sword and have inquired of God for him so that he would rise up against me by lying in ambush as it is this day? Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, and who among all your servants 
is as faithful as David. Ooh. Even the king's son-in-law, who is captain over your guard and is honored in your house. Did I just begin to inquire of God for him today? In other words, have I not been loyal to God and to David this whole time? <laughs> Saying that to Saul. Do not let the king impute anything to his servant or to any of the household of my father, for your servant knows nothing at all of this whole affair. The king, but the king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's household. And the king said to the guards who were attending him, Turn around and put the priests of the Lord to the death, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew that he was fleeing and did not reveal it to me. But the servants of the king were not willing to put forth their hands to attack the priests of the Lord. Then the king said to Doug, You turn around and attack the priests. And Doug, the Edomite, <laughs> even emphasizing that he's not even a Jew, he turned right around, attacked the priests, and he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. And he struck the knob, the city of the priests, verse 19, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and infants, also donkeys, oxen, the sheep, he struck with the edge of the sword. But one, of the, one son of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Finally, Abiathar is mentioned. After Ahimelech has been martyred. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. That was not a slip. That was not a generality. Yeah, generally in the time of Abiathar, whatever. You know, if you look at the, the timeline, right, on your Bible software, boys, like, just do that, and it's kind of close. This is very specific. He's saying to them, why was it in, around the time of Abiathar? Why was Abiathar high priest in the time of David? Why don't you tell me that? Why? Because Saul was self-willed, and he took on everyone who was loyal to the Lord and loyal to truth out of self-worship from a vantage point of pretensive Judaism. This is a rebuke. This is a rebuke. These Pharisees, they do have a precedent in the Old Testament. His, his name is Saul, Doug the Edomite. An Edomite who's become a proselyte to Israel, worshiping Yahweh, devoted to the king of Israel, Saul, who's equally worshiping himself in the form of Judaism. Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. Let's go back to Mark chapter 2, and now I can finish up. Unless you, unless you doubt there's any, any generalities here, we now see precisely why around the time of Abiathar is a profound reference. Ahimelech was no longer priest because he was killed for his loyalty to the truth. And somebody who would have gone against the traditional interpretation in order to care for the needs of mankind, and even do so in a legitimate way, becomes indicted by a Saul, just like Jesus and his disciples right here are being assaulted and condemned and indicted by the Pharisees. So, I should say this, by the way. It's interesting also, if you think about the, term, the man Abiathar, if you remember when, when Solomon became king, David left him with a charge to say, when you become king, you need to make everything right that was unfinished business. Abiathar goes on to support uh, Adonijah in the attempted coup to take over the throne before Solomon began to reign. It's very profound that not only 
did Ab Ab Abiathar's dad, not only was he killed by Saul and Doug, who are in the same, wearing the same, uh, walking in the same mold as the Pharisees, Abiathar himself walked in that same mold. And Solomon had to banish him out of his presence because of his disloyalty to David. So the indictment, it's not really the Pharisees against Jesus and his disciples. The indictment is the scriptures against the Pharisees. And that's what we see in verse 25 and 26. And finally, the last indictment is Jesus' Jesus's action. Jesus' own action defines true worship. And this is very straightforward. This doesn't require hardly any background. Verse 27, Jesus was saying to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. He points out that man came before the Sabbath, not Sabbath before man. In fact, the Jews actually believe the opposite. In the book of Jubilees, they said that the angels in heaven celebrated Sabbath, and then God created, and what happens here is a reflection of what's celebrated in heaven. That's totally backwards. As if Sabbath is the end goal, man just kind of fits into that mold. No, that's just backwards. Jesus reverses that, says the exact opposite. Man is not made for the Sabbath. The uh, Sabbath is made for man. And these, these guys have twisted and perverted religion to the point where the day that should have been such a blessing for the worshiper, for his own benefit, for his own uh, richness, his own blessing, it has now become something that's harmful. It, it's become something that, that uh, takes away from his spiritual privilege. When it comes to what's lawful on the Sabbath, works of necess necessity are lawful. Works of piety are lawful. Works of obedience are lawful. You know what's profound? Is in verse 28 we realize that whatever Jesus does is lawful. Why does Jesus say the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath? Quick quiz. What day is the Sabbath? Seventh day? You got that? Okay, I heard, I heard a few people whisper it before I saw the hand. Seventh day? What happens on the seventh day? God from create God rested from creation. Make, make no mistake. Jesus in verse 28 says, I am the creator. I rested on the Sabbath. Whatever I do is the definition of what it means to keep the Sabbath. Jesus is the one who, according to Hebrews 1, 3, upholds all things with the word of his power. I mean, as they're walking along the grain field, Jesus Christ himself is sustaining the very atoms that make up the ground that the Pharisees are standing on in order to hurl accusations against him. He is the one who created all things, and nothing has come into creation except through him. And he says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. Whatever I do is what it means to keep the Sabbath. His own practice defines the Sabbath. Man, in this story, we see poor, pathetic men in attempting to indict the scriptures, attempting to indict Jesus Christ, attempting to indict the truth, and you can't. It's unindictable. All they do is indict themselves. You probably never expected me to conclude with an outline like this, but here it goes. I'm going to give you a list of four things, and this will be quick. I don't want to end before I can just tell you this is a, an appropriate application of this text. Since this punch of Mark's story is on the unbelief of the Pharisees, and as I've mentioned that, going all the way back to chapter 1, this section doesn't end until chapter 3, verse 6, when Jesus is uh, marveling at their hardness of heart. And they plan to destroy him, and they plan to kill him. This, this antagonism just increases and increases and increases. And so Mark is documenting their unbelief. And so I just want to leave you with, with a, not hopefully an overly cynical application here. Let me give you four ways how to become an Abiathar, how to become a Pharisee, how to become a self-worshipper who imposes your personal tradition on the Bible. Number one, Use Christianity to make a name for yourself. 
1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 through 7 explain that a lot of people are in religion and handle the Bible, and they do so out of a motive to become an expert and to be perceived by others as expert, and they end up making confident assertions about things which they are totally ignorant of. Number two, remain unwilling to obey. Jesus himself said, if anyone's willing to do God's will, he will know of this teaching, whether it's from God or whether I speak from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who is seeking the glory of the one who sent him, he's true, and there's no unrighteousness in him. Jesus never sought his own glory. He only sought the glory of his Father, and that's why the Pharisees couldn't stand his message, because they were seeking their own glory. And so they were unwilling to do God's will. Number three, create religious ways to disobey. Create religious ways to disobey. Just find creative, religious, devout, and pious ways to disobey the actual words of God in the Scriptures. Psalm 119, 21 says, You rebuke the arrogant, the cursed, who wander away from your commandments. To wander away from God's commandments is arrogance. Number four, seek glory for yourself from men. Jesus also said in John 5, 43, I've come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? These are four tactics that Abiathar, Saul, the Pharisees, and every other self-worshipper who mishandles God's word has to perfect. And so that becomes a warning to us. Hopefully you get the, the benefit of that warning. That's, that's what Mark is warning us about here. We don't have to fall prey to that. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for this story. Thank you for the overwhelming clarity of your word. Lord, in this story, Jesus highlights a profound reality from the Old Testament that indicted his enemies. And Lord, I pray that that would become an encouragement to all of your children, that as we think about the potential that we have, we, we, know, we know that by nature, any one of us could become a Pharisee. We, we know uh, many of us look back at our pre-conversion days and know that we were Pharisees who did those very tactics. Uh, many who have lived inside Christianity or some form of it know what it's like to have to rework it and bend it and adapt it in order to make it serve self-worshiping purposes. And Lord, I thank you that Jesus gives us a clear articulation of your truth in such a way that it reminds us if we stick to your word and we stick to the whole counsel of what you've revealed, it will always point out any, any gap, any error, any flaw. And since we have the whole counsel, since we have all of your word, um, any deliberate, any deliberate hypocrisy is, is willful, and we have no excuse. And so I pray, Lord, that you would keep bringing your truth, whatever precise passage, whatever precise topic, that you would keep bringing it up by way of sermons and Bible studies and small groups, by way of conversation with um, like-minded believers who care for our souls, and I pray that you would in turn make this group that means of grace in the lives of others. And Lord, I also just want to pray for any who are here who do not know you. And there might be some here who are actually under the same indictment that Jesus gave to the Pharisees and perhaps their only exposure to Christianity and perhaps their very vigorous practice of Christianity is nothing more than self-worship. And I pray that you would bring them to the, to the end of themselves, that they would hate that kind of idolatry and be glad to worship you in spirit and in truth. In your name we pray. Amen.